you have your Bibles, open them to Genesis chapter number 17. We have been in this study on uh, Genesis, the life of Abraham, for a little while now. Um, when I, I've been in church really my whole life. Before I was even born, I've been in church. And we've always looked up at Abraham and just saw he was just this big guy, the, the man of faith, you know, and we just think he's just this great big hero. But understand this, that he lived his life in difficult circumstances. So many times as we look at things, we think if we could ever get things kind of figured out, if we could ever think, get things straightened out, then we could live our Christian life pretty well. If you look at Abraham's life, it was always upside down. If he had to wait for things to get good, he, could have, he would have never made it. Matter of fact, Christianity is not how good circumstances are. It's how good God is, no matter the circumstances. It's coming to a place in time to know that, and, and people ask me this, why doesn't God just take us to heaven? Look, our salvation's good for here, it'll also be good for there. And, and this is kind of a training ground. When we get to heaven, everything's going to be perfect. It's going to be glory, hallelujah. But think of the praise that God gets in the middle of this year, in the middle of COVID, when we honor His name anyway. I, you know, some years go by, I get one birthday. I think I've aged three years this year. You know, when you get older, you say time goes by faster. Can anybody agree with me? But it seems like about 10 years ago when it was February when we were all meeting together. Doesn't it seem just like a, well, it seems like a long time for me. About three years, it just is so hard. And today, to be honest with you, we've been counting uh, all the people that have come. We've had more come today than any other day since we started back May 17th. Amen? Give yourself a hand. I mean, you should. We, I've always said, you know, we're going to vote with our feet, right? When people feel comfortable, they're going to come back. And I think people are starting to feel comfortable again. But let me say to that, be careful. Be careful. We felt comfortable in June, and it spiked in July. Uh, there is still COVID out there. There are, there are things that are still upside down in this world. Uh, one of my dear friends, uh, his wife's brother passed away yesterday, 42 years old with COVID. So I'm not telling you the circumstances are now to where that's behind us. I don't think so. But I'm here to tell you that God's with us no matter the circumstances. If you're looking for, for everything to be good, then you can praise and love God and you can smile. Hold on. We need to be smiling no matter what. We need to be trusting no matter what. We need to be honoring God where we are. He's worthy of our praise no matter what. Amen? So when you look at Abram's life, we've been studying this, and this, this <clears throat> study is called Faith and Blessings because faith is what we really think of God. It's how we see God. It's how we know that He's real and alive and well and, and working in our lives. Blessings come from this faith relationship. So in Genesis 12, God made a promise to Abraham, 75 years old. In Genesis 15, He reiterated it to him again. I'm going to make of you a mighty nation. I told him to look at the stars in the heavens. Your seed, your, the ones that will come from you, will be more than the stars of heaven. Then, he made a covenant with him. God made a covenant. And in that covenant, he basically said to Abram, you don't have to do it. You be the recipient of it. I'll bless you. I'm not looking for what you can do for me. There are so many people that are tied up in what we're going to do for God. I think we should be faithful to God the things that God places before us. I think we should be a follower of God wherever He leads us. But listen, He's not looking for what comes from... He wants to do more for us. Think about this. When we get to heaven, are we going to have what we deserve there? Oh no, we're going to get much more than that. Are we going to get... Is that going to be the fruit of what we've earned with how good of a life? Oh no, much more than that. If that's the gift of God for us forever, He's not looking for something different down here. He just wants us to walk in a love relationship with Him. So in Genesis 15, Abraham, when he, or Abram, at that point when he said, all the blessings of God, the Bible says he believed. He trusted. He heard God and said, okay, I'm with you. 
Amen in his heart. And he said when he believed, it was counted to him for righteousness. This covenant, God was saying, I'm going to do all these things for you. All you have to do is receive it. And Abram said, all right. But then when we get to Genesis 16, Sarah had a plan. You see, she understood that the promises of what God had told her husband, make of him a mighty nation. But she was old. And she said, God, this word might be right. It may be good. I just don't know that you can do it in me. Have you ever thought the promises of God are good and they're wonderful and you're grateful for them? You're just not sure if you deserve it, if they're real, real for you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Well, God promised that. But sometimes do you feel like you're all alone? So Sarah thought, maybe I'm the problem. She got her handmaiden, Hagar. Abram, go in and be with her. And Abram did. She thought, this is good. Abram got the son. I've, I've got a child I'm a sur by my surrogate. I'll, I'll be the, the mother of this nation through her, through Hagar. God will have His mighty nation. Everyone wins. Now what in God's plan? What did it bring? Strife, envy, jealousy, division. That's not what God wants. We need to be faithful followers of God because His plan is that which will lead us to blessing. If we'll trust Him. If we can walk with Him. If we can believe those things. Well, then we get to Genesis 17. I'm sorry. I'm using a lapel. And every time I look down, it does that. But for some reason, I can't read my Bible up here. So I'll do, I'll do my best I can. I broke my microphone in the first service. What are you going to say? So I'm, I'm, I'm all mic'd up a different way. Look what it says in verse... One of chapter number 17. You with me? Say amen. amen. When Abram was 99 years old. If I ever make it to 99, and I won't. I want to be left out in pasture. Amen. I want a TV remote. I want my wife. She's still around. Of course, I'm not going to tell you how old she would be. But I, I want somebody to bring me some food and I'd probably just sleep in a recliner at 99 years old, but Abraham was just getting working. When I was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I'm Almighty God. This is the first time you see this in Scripture. You ever heard of the term El Shaddai? Mighty God. God who is the Most High. The Most Mighty. He is all-powerful. So God came and said, let me reveal myself to you, Abram. You may not realize this, you may not know this, but I am the God that is the most high. I am almighty. I am all powerful in all ways. Walk before me and be blameless. I think if you could put this in a New Testament context, we could look to the words of Jesus in John 15 when He said, Abide with me and I with you. Just be with me. That's good enough. Just love me. I accept you as you are. Let's just be this in this relationship together. Walk before me. Be blameless. That does not mean be perfect. God's not looking for Him to be perfect. He says, just allow me to do for you. Follow my path that I have planned for you. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Abram's heard this before. 75, he heard it. It was reiterated to him again. Now he's 99 years old. And God's saying the same thing. Do you wonder if Abraham, over 24 years, he's saying, I believed you. I've walked with you. I've trusted you. I, I keep waiting for this. You say this, but... I'm 99, Lord. What is this covenant you're talking about? Well, verse 3. Here's Abram's reaction to this. He fell on his face before God. And God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. 
You shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, father. But your name shall be called Abraham, father of many nations. For I have made you, I have made you a father of many nations. He's thinking, I got one kid by Hagar. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. When we came to this series, I picked this out. I think the Lord was leading me to it. When we talk about faith, and we're supposed to walk by faith, Hebrews chapter 11 says the only way you're going to please God is by faith. You've got to live a life where you're hearing the promises of God, you're seeing the nature of God, you're seeing the love of God, and by faith you've got to believe that it's there for you. And Abram's getting to that point. He's starting to see it and understand it. He's saying, no longer shall you be um, just a dad, but you're going to be the dad of my people. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you fruitful. Isn't that what he said in Genesis 1 when, or Genesis 2 when he told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply? He said, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants. We're going to do something that's going to be amazing and great. Then he goes on to talk about this covenant that he's going to bring with them, and he introduces to them circumcision. It's an outward sign of something that would happen in their heart. And it was circumcision was not new, it was being known in the world, but it was to be for every one of his children, of, of the, his nation, the Jewish people that we know today, would have circumcision. And circumcision is still known in our world today, and, and many uh, believers, Jews, Christians, and others otherwise, uh, many non-believers are circumcised. But to them, it was an outward symbol of, of who, what God was doing in their heart. Circumcision. And he, he said, I, this will be the outward covenant that I will have. By the way, in the New Testament, y'all know what? We don't follow circumcision the way they did for the Jewish people. But what do we have? Baptism. Go ye therefore and be baptized. Christians are to be baptized. Whenever I lead someone to the Lord, and I, I, I talk to them about what they're supposed to do after that, I say, well, you should take your Bible. You need to learn to, you need to hear God for yourself so you, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. Start reading His Word. You need to not only read your Word, but you need to learn to pray. I say, you need to, to get around, a, you need to tell others what God's done in your life. You need to be around another group of people where y'all can be discipled together. And you need to be faithful to a church. You need to join a church. And, and you need to not just do what the church can do for you, but what you can do for the church. You, you need to do these things. But there's something else I tell them. I say, look, the Lord told you you're supposed to be baptized. It's an outward expression of what God's done. And never minimize what Jesus walked 30 miles to do. Jesus went 30 miles where, where he found John the Baptist and the one who had never sinned was baptized. You know, it's amazing to me that sometimes when, I, when I'm talking to a new believer and I say, you're beginning a new walk. You've got the Holy Spirit living within you. And you need to read your Bible and you need to pray. And they'll say, yeah, that's right. You need to get a group around a group of people and you need to, to, to be discipled together. You need to be faithful to church. You, you need to have a discipleship group where you can be accountable to them. They can be accountable to you and, and grow. And they're like, yeah, that's a good thing. And you need to be baptized. I'm like, what? You see, I think that's one of the things that that people balk at because I think Satan really does not want us to get out there and be public with our Christian life. I think it's one of the first things of faith that we need to do. We do it by faith to let the world know that, that Jesus is our Savior and Lord. Satan doesn't want you to do that. He doesn't want you to have a public profession of faith. And it really doesn't matter if they're a little child. They're, they're, sometimes they don't worry about it so much. But I've talked to adults and and and... Sometimes I've, I've actually been surprised. People would walk down the aisle and they'd say, Preacher, I need to be baptized. I said, I thought you were already Christian. Well, I, I trusted the Lord years ago, but I've never followed through with believer's baptism. It's an outward profession of faith. It's a public profession of faith. So here's, here's the thing that we need to do. Whatever it is that God's drawn us to in our life, we need to be faithful to it. Now hear this. This message is not about baptism. It's about walking in a faith walk with God. Being a faithful follower of God. Trusting Him 
that you can join Him. He made covenant with us. Are we going to walk in that? Are we going to walk in that? Look what else he goes down in verse number 15. God said to Abram, As for Sarah, your wife. Now notice how that's spelled. S-A-R-A-I. That means contentious one. I told everybody in the first service, that's my wife's first name. But she didn't spell it S-A-R-A-I. And by the way, if your parents gave you that name and you spell your name S-A-R-A-I, contentious one, I'm sorry. Amen. But he said, no longer shall your wife, so your, Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but S-A-R-A-H shall be her name, which means princess, noble woman. I tell everybody, that's my wife. She's the prince. I married a princess. And I don't know why she loves me, but she does. She is called special, is what he is saying to Sarah. Now hold on. How would you like to be married to somebody like Abram? Abraham. Man, all the promises are to him. God's talking to him. He's, he's winning victories. He's, he is gathered. Everything is great. All she is is the wife. If you ever, people say uh, sometimes people don't even know Lynn's name. That's the preacher's wife. She says, I got a name. You can call me Lynn. You know, she says, I'm just known as the preacher's wife. Oh, she's so much more than that. But Sarah thought, you know, it's really not me. I mean, he's got a child, Ishmael. You know, he's 13 years old now. And I don't know what the relationship was like with Sarah and Agar. Matter of fact, in chapter 16, when, when Hagar got uh, pregnant, she and Sarah wasn't getting along, and maybe that's where that contentious stuff started coming up in it. And, and Hagar left. She ran out in the wilderness all by herself, pregnant woman. And the angel of the Lord came and met her and talked to her and said, no, 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 no. Hagar, your child is going to be blessed. I'm going to make a nation of it too. And she learned a new name for God. The name, the God who sees. Do you think God sees you? There are times that you probably say, yes, Lord, you're with me. But have you ever thought, you know, God doesn't understand my circumstance. He knows your prayers. Matter of fact, I don't even have to say them out loud. He knows my thoughts. He knows my griefs. He knows my pains. He knows my fears. He knows the things that I, I'm afraid are going to happen. He also knows the things that He said that He will make happen for me. He's the God who sees and knows it all. Hagar got that new experience. And Sarah's probably saying, who am I? He said, oh no, no. Let her know that she is going to be a great nation. Let's go on. I want you to hear what he said. Abram said to God, verse... 18. Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Hold on. I skipped verse 17. Back up. Look in verse 17. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed. When God told him that, that uh, she was... Well, let me read verse 16. I, I'm skipping two verses. He said, I will bless her and also give you a son by her. She's 89 years old right now. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Abram couldn't believe it. But this is where faith comes. He said, oh no. No. Verse 19. God said, no, Sarah, your wife, shall bear a son. It's not Ishmael. You're going to have another one. Listen to me now. I promise. I promise. Have you ever been through the stores? And, you know, I, I think Kroger's has this. Uh, I don't know where you do your grocery shopping, but they've got a little stand of Christian books they, they put there. And one of the biggest sellers is called The Promises of God. There's a little book in there that has all the promises 
And people are supposed to take those and read, read at least one promise a day and claim it as your own. How many of you have read the promises of God in His Word? And you know that He is a God who sees all. He's a God who knows and loves and wants to bless, but you might say, yeah, but me? My circumstance? Where I'm at? God would use me? God would bless me? Yeah. His promise is for you. His promise is for you. Take your Bible. Turn over to the New Testament. I want you to turn over to the book of 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter one. Can you trust his promises? Are you there? Say amen. Look in verse number eighteen. But as God is faithful, that's the first thing you need to decide in your heart. Is God faithful? Our word to you was not yes and no, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, by Silvanus, Timothy, was not yes and no, but in Him, that is in Christ, was yes. For all the promises of God in Him are yes. And in Him, amen, which means it is true, so be it. To the glory of God through us, He said, all the promises of God in Christ are yes. All the promises are for you. It is true. So be it. All this is for you, for the glory of God through us. Salvation is there for you. Blessings are there for you. You know, uh, like I said, I've been a preacher for a lot of years. And... I've had to deal with a lot of people who doubt their salvation. And they'll say, you know, I just don't know if I did it right. Matter of fact, that you don't, don't raise your hands. I, I don't need to know those things. We can talk about it if you want to talk about it. But there's probably a, a great number of people in here who have doubted your salvation. And you're like, I, I, I want to make sure I do it right. I want to make sure I've done the right thing. All you have to do is believe, pray, confess your sins. I mean, Jesus died on the cross for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him. Y'all y'all believe a whosoever? I mean, are you a whosoever? I mean, that's just an anybody that will confess their sins, believe in Him, trust in Him, ask Him to do for you what only He can do. He'll hear your prayer. He'll answer. He won't send it out to the committee where they have to think about it and discuss it on it and vote if they're going to... No, He said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, what? Shall be saved. But yet I talk to them and they're like, I, I hope I did it right. I I sometimes I feel I did. Sometimes I feel like I don't. And really what they're saying is, it's so important. I want to make sure that I did the right thing. But, but here it is, is, there's really some wrong theology here because what they're looking for is, is I ask Him to, be in my, to come into my heart. I really haven't done much. And what they're feeling is, is conviction of God to become a follower. They're thinking it's their salvation that's messed up. There was a book that came out by, the name, by a man by the name of Kyle Ottoman. Magnificent man of God. And the first time, that it's called Not a Fan. First time I saw it, I was driving down the road and there was this church over here and on the church sign it said, Not a Fan. And I'm driving down the road and I read it, Not a Fan. I thought that was the stupidest sign I'd ever seen in all my life. What do they mean they're not a fan? They're not a fan of what? I was almost offended by it. But then I found out about what Kyle Ottoman was preaching and talking about and, and he said, too many people today are a fan of Jesus rather than a follower of Jesus. They admire Him from a distance. 
But what He wants is an intimate, personal, close relationship. As you walk through this life, things are going to be backwards. There's going to be sicknesses. There's going to be car wrecks. There's going to be misunderstandings. There's going to be fusses and fights. There's going to be division. There will be envy. There will be lust. There will be heartache. There will be pain. I told you last Sunday, uh, one of my dear friends, I served uh, on a, one of his boards at one time. I actually hired him for a job at one time. He had a 38-year-old son that just collapsed in the front yard and died. His wife found him in the front yard, tried to revive him. No rhyme, no reason, heart attack. 38 years old. We're wondering, where is, where is this? Why is this? God, where are you? But God allows us to walk through a world that He didn't want us to walk through, a sin-filled, hard, difficult, so that we could understand the, the goodness of God in the worst of circumstances. When we get to heaven, we'll know that we are there, not by our grace, but by His goodness. Everything will be provided for us. Everything will be good. Everything will be wonderful. It's not what I earn. It's what He will give me forevermore. Down here, it's the same way. So I meet these people and they're wondering, is my salvation right? And really, it's usually not their salvation that's wrong. It's their followship. And Kyle Ottoman, in his book, when he said, not a fan, he said, too many people are fans of Jesus when they need to be a follower of Jesus. We need to just abide with Him as He said. Walk with Him as He told Abram. We're going to go through some difficult things. It doesn't matter that you're 99 years old. I'm the God that's Almighty. I can. You can trust Me. You can, you can believe that I'm going to come through for you. Look what it says, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. All the promises of God in verse 20 are in Him are yes and in Him amen to the glory of God through us. Now He who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. In that day, if they were going to write something, they would write it on a piece of parchment and they would roll it up and they would take some some wax and put it over the place where the, the, the part the paper would come together. And then they would take the ring, the, the seal on the ring, and they would seal it in the wax. So that the person who received it, it would know that it had not been opened, it was for them, and they could look at the seal and know who sent it. He says here, here's his theology. He said this God who has established it, has anointed us. It's the Holy Spirit of God. He has sealed us. Jesus sealed us with the Holy Spirit. We have the mark of God in our lives. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've repented of your sins and you've trusted in Him as your personal Savior and Lord, you can look at the times in your life and you know that, that God was there. You know that it was His voice. You know the feeling that He was with you. Nobody else has to convince you of that. You can look to those times and you can know because it is His Spirit that was given to seal you. But He also uses this as a guarantee. The King James Version, I love the King James here because it says, the earnest of the Holy Spirit. We don't use that word earnest very much. But my wife sells real estate. And in real estate, if you find a house that you want and you say, I'm going to make an offer on that house. I want to buy that house. And then you will put up earnest money. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Shake your head. And that is a promise saying that, that you are going to buy that house and you're putting money up to prove it. And by the way, when you buy the house, that earnest money is applied toward it. You don't lose a thing. Amen? God says... I have given you my promise. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Walk with me, he says. 
have this discipled relationship, grow in grace. The last words that Jesus said should be the first words. Go and make disciples. We're to become a disciple of God. So he says, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the earnest of the Holy Spirit to prove to you and to hold to you until the day that I bring you home. How do I know I'm saved? The Holy Spirit lives within me. I walk with Him. Now hold on. If I'm trusting in that Holy Spirit to give me to heaven one day, I should be able to trust that same Holy Spirit in my circumstance, in my prayer request, in my difficulty, in that relationship, in that job, at the doctor's office, at the bank, at the family reunion. I pray for the young people. They're setting the stage for their life. When they come and trust God, they're, tr they're having to choose a vocation, what they're going to do in life. I pray that God leads them. Choose a helpmate to walk with them the rest of their life. I pray that they let God lead them. Where they're going to live, where they're going to go to school, where they're going to work, all of those things. Where they're going to go to church, what they're going to do with their life, how they're going to deal with temptations, how are they going to deal with their friends who invite them to go do the wrong things. See, God says, I'll take you to heaven one day. I'll provide for all of it. But don't you understand and know that I want to bless you today? The promises that I have are for you. Are you willing to walk? Is there anything that if God said to you, it would make you pause before you said yes to Him? Is there anything that you're holding in your heart more dear than your relationship with Him? Are you a fan? Or are you a follower? He said, not only are you to be disciple, but you're supposed to go make disciples. Are you out seeking to make disciples with other people? Are you willing to be held accountable? Are you willing to get into a relationship where you can hold someone else accountable? Do you want someone to pray with you, or are you willing to pray with someone else? Are you willing to walk through life with God and walk through life with each other? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but also to love your neighbor. It's a faith walk. We're not supposed to be waiting for everything to be perfect and then serving. We're just supposed to serve the Lord with gladness today. What would it be like if the church became disciples? Not just fans cheering him on. I mean, fans can do it from the grandstand, right? They can sit up there and watch other people do all the work on the field. And cheer them on. Or y'all were ready to suit up and get down and walk with Christ wherever He leads. You ready to follow? Is your answer yes? Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for the word that You gave Abraham, but I pray today that You, you would amen it in our hearts. The promises of blessing that you gave him. I pray, Lord, that we would receive those as promises for us as well. Lord, I know that you love others. Lord, I know that you love me. And I pray for all those who are in this room and that are watching online that they will know that you love them as well. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone that hears my voice that has never moved into a relationship with you, Lord, that they would confess their sins, that they know that they have sinned, confess them to you. And Jesus, confess that they believe in you and trust you. They know that you're, you're, you're God's son that came and died on the cross of Calvary for them. To forgive them. And Lord, I pray that they would believe in their heart and ask you to come into their life and save them. And Lord, make a pledge to you that you would give them the Holy Spirit, you would give them heaven, but they would give you their heart and their life and their sins and their 
their choices just to walk with you, be a, a follower. But Lord, for those that are already Christians, Lord, maybe they need to do a checkup on their discipleship as well, their fellowship. Lord, help us follow you, not just for an hour here or there, but every moment, everywhere. Father, make this very plain by your Spirit, one heart at a time. Speak personally, O oh Lord, to us. Draw us close, O oh God, as only you can. Do in these moments a God work. And sir, to you we will say amen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.